you everyone for uh, tuning in. A little tip, don't do um, software updates an hour before doing a live stream. It was cutting really, really, really close. I didn't think it would take that long. Um, you know, and get this little indicator. It tells you how much time you've got. It's finished and it seemed to be slowing down. But anyway, so just updated my software. But I was a little afraid that if I went live, it would start automatically uh, a software update while I was going live and really screw things up. So, hey, I'm going to do a roll call, um, sort of introduce what we're talking about today or this evening, whatever, and then bring on the guest. Will is uh, standing by. Um, of course, I got two chats going on here. Room, so I, let me do a roll call real quick. All right, so we got the Whiskey Crusaders. Hey, uh, Matt, thank you much for tuning in. And thank you for spelling my name correctly because you know that irritates me when people use it a C. Steve A, thank you much for tuning in. Andrew Perel, Travis Woolard, uh, thank you much for tuning in. Uh, Trev Wilson, thank you for tuning in. Andrew Spurell, I think I already said that already. Roslov Traps, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Johnny Drum, thank you very much for tuning in. R Robot Scott, for, for a second I thought I said Ro Robert. Uh, Captain, make it happen. Thank you very much for tuning in, sir. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> uh, OG Brick 420. Because we all know what 420 is. Um, scroll down a little bit more. Master Drum, Jason, thank you very much for tuning in. This is my third live stream in like four days. I was on, uh, Jason and I were both on uh, the Scotch Four Dummies Thursday night. I went live Friday night. Now we're going to live Sunday night. And the reason why we're going live Sunday night, and it's going to sort of fit in with the theme, um, if you may, you may notice in the little banner down below, it says Psalm TV on Apple Podcasts, Podomatic, and Stitcher. So we're going to talk, I want to talk about being a sommelier. We're going to talk about um, wine sommeliers, whiskey sommeliers, talk about working in the trade, not just the certifications with pins or medals or certificates you hang in your wall and all that stuff. I want, to talk, I want to talk about the sommelier business. Talk about having a dual passion for wine and whiskey, as both Will and I have. Um, and so, But I want to start off giving a little bit of plug. If you're not familiar with sommelier, sommelier exams, there's a series of uh, documentaries. The first was called Psalm. Uh, it was done by Jason Wise. Uh, the first person you see in it is a gentleman by the name of Ian Cobble. I won't give any spoilers because you haven't seen it, but eventually he becomes he becomes a master sommelier along with a bunch of other gentlemen. And I actually trained with um, uh, Ian Cobble um, to become a certified uh, sommelier. Um, then they came up with a second one. So this was this is a journey of uh, five gentlemen seeking to become a master sommeliers, and you kind of get an understanding, a glimpse of the, the 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 stress, the tension, and the difficulties of it. Then they came out with Psalm into the bottle, which is about wine in of itself. St wine becomes more of the star, <coughs> and they go through 10 different wines, different regions, different producers. Really, really, really great. And then they came up with a third one, which was sort of a revision of a uh, return to uh, the 1976 Jesuit of Paris. And it was focused on blind tasting and then particularly focused on Pinot Noir rather than Cabernet-based wine as did the 1976 Judgment of, Judgment of Paris. So uh, they now have uh, a podcast called Psalm TV. Uh, the Psalm um, um, franchise from uh, the movies is getting larger and larger. So if you are interested in uh, what some sommeliers do, interested in wine, uh, you want to check that out. So uh, but being a sommelier isn't just about wine, although – in the restaurants, 90% plus, they also do beverage service, uh, what is cocktails, um, spirits, um, aperitifs, um, and, and uh, whiskeys and so forth. And they've even branched now off in, into uh, tea and coffee service. And old school sommeliers also had to know cigars. Uh, David Glancy, another master sommelier that I've trained with, uh, he runs the San Francisco Wine School. And he had to learn cigars. He got he became a master sommelier over in the UK, whereas a lot of the other sommeliers I know became sommeliers here uh, in the United States. So, alrighty. So with that, uh, hey, Dram Bam, thank you, ma'am. I like that. I like that name. Thank you for joining in. All right. So, uh, Will, if you're ready, give me a thumbs up. 
Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. And here we have – oh, well, thank you much for joining us. Oh, hold on. It's probably me. Hold on. It's not you. It's me. Talk now. Nope, I still can't hear you. Hold on. It's, hold on. Can you talk now? Hmm. Oh, you know what? All my settings are correct. No, it's mine. It's mine. So oh, I, 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 my mic. I didn't unmute the mic. My bad. <laughs> Shit happened. Hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> so hey, yeah, thank you for on So uh, let's pour ourselves some whiskey before we get uh, jibber jabbering. Let's. I have the Blantons. What uh, you got? Do I? Okay. So this one is. This was uh, dumped. It says dumped. I guess dumped. That's kind of funny. 12 27 2018. So just after Christmas. Where, stored in warehouse H. Rick House number one. And this is at 93 proof. What's yours? Uh, I have dumped on 12 1 17. Stored in warehouse H. Rick 25. Barrel number 541. Okay. What's the proof on it? Mine is 93. Okay. That 46. <coughs> I imagine to keep that as a constant. I'm not as familiar with Blanton's and a lot of the bourbons as uh, some of the others who are, are, are others. Anyhow, let's pour some. You know, now I've so mate John Wick 3 just came out on video. I don't know if you've seen the John Wick films. Yeah. With Keanu Reeves. Yeah. And now I can't look at Blanton's without immediately thinking of John Wick. Yeah. Uh, and there's a short scene as well where he does an art bag. Although you can't really get as good of a glance uh, of the bottle, but it's obviously an Ardbeg for those who uh, know Ardbeg. Yeah, the bottle is kind of unmistakable, isn't it? Yeah. Ooh, man, just from here, I can get the nose on this. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. Um, Blanton's has been all over the place in terms of price. Um, most people generally say that it's sort of a middle of the road sort of bourbon. It's, it's, it's nothing to die for. But um, in terms of the quality price ratio, um, but I've been seeing them popping up here uh, by the pallet load here yeah. in California. So it's done, but other places people have a hard time getting it. Texas, the allocation is a is a lot less than than California for sure. Uh, we don't get them by the pallet load. Uh, okay, but most of the reputable distributors will still sell them for about fifty. So, okay, I'm okay with paying fifty for you know. Like you were saying, a middle of the road bourbon. Um, it's not as epic as a lot of people uh, make it out to be to me, uh, but it is a really good bourbon, and it's a very, very round, cohesive uh, journey of a bourbon. So, uh, I'm going to get to know you a little bit better. So, you guys had me on to talk about being a whiskey psalm, and yeah. we we're focused on that, and along with Matt and some others. Um, and that was on the Whiskey Crusaders channel. For those who don't know, Will, he's one of the members of the Whiskey Crusaders, and he's down in Texas. Uh, and your wife as well as one of the Whiskey Crusaders, yes? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, however, you actually work in the trade as a sommelier, work in the floor. So I want to get into that a little bit. Um, so for those who don't know, if you haven't watched, most people do. Most people know me. Um, I've got another wine channel. I started it three years ago as a means of studying wine. Um, and posting notes and having more sort of intensive, uh, it's sort of my own study group for studying wine while studying for the WSET diploma. One of the units is on spirits. So that got to me introduced to spirits. That got me introduced to whiskey. Next thing I know, poof, I became my passion. I had a passion for whiskey. And, uh, you know, a year ago, in fact, a year ago next Friday, I sp split my channels. And so now I have a whiskey channel and a, a, a wine channel. Um, and uh, I then ventured into whiskeys going to uh, Kentucky, Texas, and two trips to Scotland. I've now been to about 40 dis distilleries in, in Scotland. And so I've had, you know, and now I'm just sort of reviving my wine channel because I've been neglecting it. But I think people um, have misconceptions about working in wine or working in whiskey, sort of a uh, romantic notion of it more glamorous than what it can be. Um, I so, I wanna, so I want to discuss that. But before we do, let me hear about your story. Did you start off with wine? Did you start with whiskey? Or has it always been sort of both at the same time? How did you get into this? 
so I got into this through wine. Uh, I had a passion for wine. I had a passion for the knowledge of wine uh, and being able to sell it in my restaurant. I was a server uh, at the restaurant that I currently work. And I was told very early on, if you want to make money in this place, you need to know how to sell wine. You need to know about wine. Uh, and I took that really um, personally. And I, I really took that to heart. So I started learning as much as I could. I spent nine months studying six hours a day, six days a week, and uh, almost drove my wife insane. Uh, but we, we pulled through and I was able to pass my, my certification pretty quickly. And on that journey, uh, I learned that I had a passion for whiskey as well as far as drinking it. Uh, I enjoyed the taste of whiskey a lot. So uh, that got me thinking about, you know, that journey as well. So in terms of wine, so how long ago, I mean, how long ago did you sort of get into doing wine? Uh, three years. Three years. Okay. So do you have a particular favorite varietal or region or anything like that? Uh, I like big, bold, in-your-face flavors okay. uh, for the most part in everything. So uh, anything from a big, loud Shiraz to a uh, – I like, I like Rhone's. Uh, I like uh, Northern Rhone a lot. Uh, I like Cab, uh, especially Bordeaux. I'm a big fan of funky flavors. So okay. Bordeaux and uh, Burgundy are, are always wines that I reach for. So now at the now at the restaurant, do you, do you also serve whiskeys as well as wines or, or, or is whiskey more? We, like we wine? have a pretty decent whiskey collection uh, that is ever changing and we're trying to get it to grow a little bit more, but you know, it's a, it's a struggle. So one of the things that's been difficult for me is having dual passions and yet, you know, because I was in wine for so long and I kind of have a sense of loyalty to it, you know, <laughs> and yeah. the an industry and I haven't been as communicative. So there's three wineries that I sort of consult for part time, particularly now, because now we're heading into harvest season. Mm -hmm. I start getting kind of crazy and I start getting more emails and whatever. And I'm like, uh, you know, um, so people, the reason why I don't, I don't work full time in the wine industry because I wouldn't make enough money at it. And yeah. every time I look at it and then I start looking at salaries, I'm like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> I'm not taking, a, I'm not taking, you know, cut my pay in half in order to go work in the industry. But I think also uh, people have a romantic notion as if, hey, you just go to work, you just sit around and drink wine all day, talk or whiskey all day uh, and or People have this idea, oh, the beautiful vineyards. We'll buy some property and we'll grow in grapes. And, you know, and they don't realize how much time is spent fighting critters that want to eat all your grapes, uh, fighting the government who wants, has an unbelievable amount of paper I have, I have to do, or working in the industry, in terms of in the restaurant, how much time you're going to spend doing inventory and paperwork mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff as well. So t tell me a little bit about that as well. I do spend a fair amount of time drinking. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, but it is not as romantic as it seems, I suppose. Uh, I have a, a bi-weekly inventory where I'm staying at work very, very late to count every single bottle in the restaurant. Um, the ordering process to make sure that we have all of the wine every single week uh, is absolutely a chore. Uh, but it is fun as well. Yep. I, I do absolutely love my job. So... I have no, I have no complaints about my job. Yeah, something doesn't have to be easy Perfect. in order to be en enjoyable, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. But so if you can find something you have a real passion about, um, and then even though you know people like so like um, Mater Keenan, who you know rock star, started his own winery down in uh, Arizona, um, but he has dirt under his fingernails from planting his own vines. You know, the guy works on it and yeah. now he, he thinks of more himself as a winemaker who does this rock and roll thing on the side, you know, because he's because it, it's it's in his blood. And he really, really enjoys it. And he's had to fight the elements like crazy down there. Um, so, yeah, unless you're willing to blood, sweat and tears, really uh, pour yourself out into it, um, then it's really not going to be for you. And I'll admit I've spent time working in a winery. And I'm just like, son of a bitch, this is, freaking, <laughs> this is hard work. Uh, and I know people standing on the floor, of, you know, for how many hours a day, you don't see a lot of master sommeliers, although I know of two, 
one Colorado, one San Francisco, still work the floor. Eventually, you get up to maximum age, you make the real money. They tend to get more into management rather than working the floor. Yeah. Uh, highlight a question real quick from Johnny Drum. He's asking, how do we feel about the movie Sideways' uh, accurate portrayal of the wine? Uh, other than them ruining Merlot for the population, I I really love the movie Sideways. I thought it was uh, a fantastic movie. I, I like Paul Giamatti, though, so uh, if he's in it, I'm probably going to watch it. Uh, I think the movie does a pretty good job of portraying you know wine and, and what flavors you're going to get out of specific things that they're tasting. Um I'm looking for the quote now. Uh, I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot. No, 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 no. I'm looking for the comment you're com the one you're commenting on. Oh. I saw it as well, and I didn't. I, I, I was trying to go back and highlight it. Johnny Drum. Da -da -da -da. See, I need I need a moderator just to track this stuff. Right. Anyway, so on the issue of that movie, because I've watched that movie a lot. Yeah. Um, have you ever been to the Santa Barbara area? No, I haven't. Okay. So that was my secret place that most people didn't know about that I loved to visit before that movie came out. And that, uh, movie, that movie ruined that place for you. Yeah, in a sense, in a sense. So Santa Barbara, um, if you're into surfing, golf, horseback riding, and wine, that place is heaven because it's got all of that going on there. Um, and there's this one particular canyon that goes east and west rather than north and south um, that brings in some cool air, uh, which cools off the region, which then makes it ideal for Pinot Noir. Most of our canyons, in fact, almost all that I know of in California run north, north, south. This one runs east, west. And that's where you will find uh, Sanford and Almarosa. Sanford is featured in the winery, in the movie, although it's not really Sanford, it's actually Almarosa. Yeah. San okay, this gets in the business. Sanford, um, uh, Richard Sanford, he started his winery. The difficulty is money, right? They say it takes a, a large fortune to make a small fortune. So what are you going to do for money? You either go into debt or you made money doing something else. Instead, what he does is he makes a partnership with the Terlato family. You familiar with the Terlato family? No. Terlato family, uh, one out of eight bottles sold here in the United States comes from the Terlato family, even if you don't see the name on it. Oh, wow. Not only in terms of producer and the amount of wineries they own, but an importer as well. So they're very, 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 very big, based out of Chicago. Um, so they own um, Chimney Rock, and they own, oh, my brain just went blank, another winery up in Napa Valley. Anyway, so they had different philosophy, big business versus quality, quality versus quantity. And so Richard Sanford sold his half of the winery, his own half of the winery to them. So they now own a winery that his name is on, Sanford. He went down the road and started Amarosa. So Amarosa is the actual winery that's in the movie, not Sanford, even though they call it Sanford. It's actually Amar Amarosa. And Chris, the guy with the long hair and the beard, he's actually does work. He actually works there. He's still there. He's still there. Uh, but anyway, that's the story behind that. And what I think about the movie, um, funny movie, um, beautiful scenery. Um <laughs> flawed characters flawed characters i like the movie a lot of my friends in the wine industry don't good. they don't uh but um i like a movie with a good flawed character yeah well iron man is a classic flawed character in a sort of mm -hmm. redemption you know uh you know he's just you know uh, uh make, you know uh, making us money off of selling weaponry and so forth and anyway so uh and we are way off topic by the way <laughs> but I just to answer one question. So the movie's okay. I like it, but um, you know, whatever. All right, let's get back to what we were talking about. <laughs> so I think I think my favorite part of my job is the fact of that I get to try as many wines as I do. Uh, I'm constantly having people calling me up, wanting to come and taste me, uh, wanting to come and bring me something new or exciting. Um, and just basically wanting to give me give me juice to drink. And I, I always think that that's really amazing and really cool. And that's really, you know, unless you're going to have money to spend to buy real nice wines. Yeah. To then develop your palate, which is what I've done. Um, unless, you're, unless you're working in a restaurant or a retail store where you have constant exposure and access, then it's really hard to prepare for any further exams if you're going to continue on and study for exams uh, or really get to know the world of wine. Uh, yeah. and so that is a definite.
benefit there as well as, you know, to, so the, the wine community here in San Francisco is huge. Yeah. Wine community in Napa Valley is huge. What's it like down where you're at? Our wine community is smallish, uh, but it, it has its outreaches. We Grapevine, Texas is very close to uh, where we are here in the DFW area. It's within the DFW area. Uh, and there's a fairly large wine industry out of Grapevine. Uh, within downtown Fort Worth, I have probably seven other restaurants that have sommeliers in it. And we are all um, fairly close knit. Okay. Uh, we all know of each other, know, know each other. Um, we do get together uh, and blind taste each other, which is pretty cool. Have you ever met James uh, Tidwell by any chance? He's a master sommelier. And runs I don't believe so. Yeah, so James Tidwell, um, he Is runs he Dallas. Yeah, yeah. So he, he runs a Texom, um, which I've yet to attend. I need to attend that event. Um, real, real super tall guy, uh, clean bald head like I got, except he's slim. Uh, super, super nice guy. He's also, I believe, I think he also has a diploma from the W set. And I think the last time I talked to him, I think he was looking at seeing if he could also become a master of wine. And there's only Currently, there's only four of those. Um, so I think he was looking at also adding Master of Wine uh, to his uh, resume as well. So, yeah, um, if you're interested, I don't know if you're interested in pursuing more wine studies or getting more into wine. Uh, I can say hello to him and try to introduce you to him and um, see how things go from there. But he's up there, up there in Dallas. But a really super nice guy. And so it would be really cool. And now you're scheduling. My, my biggest problem is my schedule. Yeah. But if, if Texom comes around, uh, you and I go to Texom and just get to know and interact with people there. That'd be awesome. That would be very awesome. So uh, I'll have to keep my eye open for it. My biggest problem is is scheduling. Yeah. It's not and, and just trying to get out of here. But I can get a nonstop flight to, to Dallas or whatever. So that should work. All right. You're right. Yeah, we're good. Okay. I spilled. We're okay. Uh oh, man down. Just a little bit of one tiny man. It's okay. Oh yeah, it's a small man. <laughs> so um, so so I know chefs. I had a girlfriend that was a chef. I know chefs. They spend all day cooking in the kitchen, you know. And the last thing they feel like doing when they go home is cooking. <laughs> and uh, it seems some whiskey tubers, a few maybe experience the same thing is that, yeah, they were whiskey tubers and left being a whiskey tuber. Now they've gotten into the business and boop, they've disappeared. Yeah. And I'm wondering it's a matter of time or it's just a matter of, I've been dealing with whiskey all day long. I don't feel like going home and doing more whiskey videos or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're doing the real thing, the real stuff, the real, they're in the real whiskey world. They don't feel like, you know, contending, you know, uh, or don't have the same driver need to uh, be interactive with whiskey because that's what they're doing all day long. Yeah. Do you well, have any of that? Me, I'm not really. I, I get. I'm smelling a lot of wines at work. I'm. I'm. I'm talking about you know smells and things, but I'm not really drinking a heck of a lot of wine unless I'm actually just sitting there in a tasting. So uh, most of my tastings take place early on in my shift, so that I have plenty of time to sober up. Okay. Um, and then I spend the most of the night just talking about flavors uh, as opposed to actually drinking. Right. So it's. By the time I get home, I'm back in the mood to to maybe have another pour of something because I've spent all of this time talking about how amazing these things are, and I might just have to go grab something, you know? Okay, right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. So, because um, I know some, and, and and you you almost you know get green with envy. I know mm -hmm. some people, and they'll talk about the wines that they get to taste while they're at work, and for them, you know, for you know, uh, Michelin star restaurants, you know. You know, that, that's why I always use, I always have a white tablecloth, you know, because it's out of a tradition of having that white background when I'm looking at things. Um, is, you know, they really have to be on top of the game. They really need to know the wine um, menu. And so it's a regular thing where they could be busy doing service and uh, the floor manager goes, we just opened this, taste this. And they're like, I, I was going to hey, taste this. I'm like, okay. All right, and they're blinding them in the middle of service. Well, what do you think it is? And that's how they got trained: is they're being blind tasted on wines in in the middle of doing service. So while they're running in and out, 
from the back into the front and doing table service, they're getting blind tasted on wines. And Raj Parr, for example, uh, you, you know Raj, who Raj Parr is? Um, I don't. If I was know, thinking you were meeting on the floor, uh, like standing right there next to a table. We actually do that with our staff. Uh, no, no, and, behind, and that's how well, they're running back and forth with, with wines, and then they get they get tested in the back as they're before they head back out onto the floor. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I, may have, I may have pulled that on a couple of people before. Right, right. And of course, there's always the issue of making sure something's not, you know, doesn't have any TCA or well, something. That's, like that. that's what I get asked a lot of is just give this a quick smell. Do you, you know, is there anything, is this still good? And I'm like, yeah, it smells like a Chianti. We're good. So, <laughs> so um, in terms of whiskeys, I know Sarah's big on the high proof bourbons, which is why we're having yeah. a little bit bourbon today uh where do you yeah. tend to fall in uh i'm with you i'm an r bag guy okay you like the peated yeah yeah i really do uh i can get behind uh some bourbons there are some that are to me really magical um joseph magnus uh is one of them that i i really really enjoy that's probably one of my favorite bourbons so uh dram bam thank you man ask me, eric how was the blanton's tonight blanton's is blanton's it's classic bourbon profile, um, you know, corn, vanilla, uh, caramels, uh, a little bit of cinnamon. It ha it hits, you know, if classic, you know, profile bourbon. It hits all the notes. There's nothing about it that makes you go wow. Mm -mm. Uh, it's not like Elijah Craig. Um, it, and there's nothing that stands out as being something super unique and different than it, than any other. Um, uh, I just got, I was just clicking. Another comment over here, or or super different than any of the else. Say like like Booker's has a unique character to it, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, some of the wild turkeys and so forth. There's something that really makes them stand out. I would say this is just sort of a classic standard profile of a bourbon in a super fancy bottle. And there's nothing. Do you, nothing wrong with that. Do you wrong think with that. that that itself is what makes it stand out though to people? Um, is that it is just a ridiculously cohesive and uh, very, for the for lack of a better term, round and smooth journey for being a, a high proof beverage. This does not have the bite of some forty percent things that I've had. So yeah, um, I think that in and of itself, what made it what made it become so famous. I, you know, I never thought. In terms of the bite, I, I I probably could because I do so much whiskey. I've almost become a little deaf to it or numb to it a little bit. Like if you yeah. if if you're in a rock and roll band, you have a danger of developing tinnitus because you listen to loud music all the time. You know, you just don't hear it anymore and stuff. Uh, yeah. I think this three years ago when I first got into whiskey, I would have been, you know, I, it would ooh yeah. the bite ooh the thing goes. Whereas now it's not. Um, okay. okay, so so think about it this way. Um, I deal mostly with people that drink whiskey on a big cube, right? But they don't touch Blantons. Blantons they can sip on neat, and they don't want to. They don't want a big cube for Blantons. They want to sip on that Blantons neat, right? And, and I think that's kind of where I'm getting that from. It's it's not one that needs that big cube to cut the yeah, alcohol sure. bite away. Sure. It's just going to be a smooth, cohesive journey without it. So these guys are buying, you know, fifteen dollar you know, bourbon in their, in their cube because it's got a bite to it. Uh, but they come to see me and, you know, they'll sip on some Blantons and understand that, you know, not all whiskey needs to have that. I, truth, the, my, I only have one reason for adding an ice cube and that's the weather, the temperature. I, I never yeah. need to, in the middle of winter, if I, in the middle of, so that's the one that I've been putting ice on lately, I would say, um, uh, Iron Rooks at sixty point whatever percent ABV. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and big, yeah, and, 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 and up to that some of the Garrison you. Brothers, some of the, the Garrison mm -hmm. Brothers as well, real high ABV. Um, uh, the Redemptive Rye as well, uh, barrel proof number nine. I love that. One. I love that one. It's a it's a high rye bourbon. Uh, that one, but yeah, this or like Wellers or you know, Maker's Mark or a lot of these other ones. Yeah, I would never feel the need to. My only yeah. reason to would be just to cool it down a, a little bit due, due to the weather and so forth. 
So um, go ahead. I was going to ask you a question off topic. Have you ever used whiskey stones? Yeah, actually, I got sent some whiskey stones uh, in the mail for free, and I didn't think they helped. I didn't either. I didn't think they helped a whole lot. I didn't think they cooled down a whole lot. I would need like a whole handful of them to really have an impact on it. I would, uh, I would I like scratching up my glass. I'd need so many rocks in there, I think. Yeah, and, and I would have to clean them. And yeah, I mean, I just didn't find any use. I didn't find any use for them. What I think would be better and would like to have, and there might be something out there, maybe you know of, is something you, it's like a, a cool, cold coaster. Mm. You set that on. So it keeps it cool that way. Rather than adding something to your whiskey, you have something that you, you set your glass on. Because so I can put my glass in a freezer, you know, and get it cold, but it's not going to last the whole time. Sort of like a coffee cup warmer that keeps your coffee warm. Yeah. So that way it goes cold. There may maybe be a, uh, maybe a, a gel wrap that can like fit on the bottom of a Glen Karen and come up. Oh, well, you know bit. what? There is one called a, there is a Yeti. Yeah. I have not had it. I've heard of it. So I have a coworker who uses one for uh, keeping his um, coffee warm, but I've heard you can, they also have a whiskey one. So you can try that as well. Interesting. So, um, so are, are you, so there's just for everybody who's watching, there's certifications and then there's vocation. Um, there's, you know, there, so Raj Parr, uh, who's written books on being a small A, he was a floor uh, for 18 years. He's now a winemaker in California. Um, he never took any exams and yet he's got one of the best noses, one of the best palates, particularly for, for Burgundy. That guy's crazy. He'll, he'll smell and, and taste a wine and tell you what dirt the, 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 the vineyards are growing on. That's, that's freaky, you know, yeah. um, but he's also not a big Bordeaux fan. There's other wines he's not real big on, um, but he never had any certifications. So if anybody, and, and he won't refer to himself as a psalm anymore, as a psalm anymore. everybody else does because he's now a winemaker um, and he's not working in the trade doing it. Right. And so there's sort of a debate about that. Anyway. Yeah. So, I've, uh, I've always said that the only reason why I refer to myself as a wine sommelier is because I actually work at my, my job. My my living comes from being a wine sommelier. That's what I do. Um, and that's honestly the only reason why I refer to myself as one. Right. Uh, I feel like, well, when I was a server and I had my certification, I didn't refer to myself as a wine som. I, you know, it was it's just... I, it wasn't, you know, what I did. So I can understand where he's coming from on that. You know, if it's not what you're doing, why are you calling yourself that? Right. So, and, and so here's a touch on that we get on this subject. So um, my brain just went blank. He's a medical doctor. Was a medical doctor for many, many, many years. He's now a master of wine. And I'm going to kick myself for not remember his name. Super neat guy. My brain just went. He's still doctor. Son of a bitch. I hate this happens when you get older. Names just kind of drop off. Um, anyway, he's a med he's still a doctor, but he's not practicing medicine. There's also so Robert Sinsky is a medical doctor, has a winery up in the Napa Valley. Um, um, Bruce, David Bruce, Dr. David Bruce, winemaker in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I don't think he's practicing medicine anymore. So he's still Dr. David Bruce. He's just now doing wine as a full time gig. Yeah. So I wouldn't take something just because they're not working in a particular field. I wouldn't take the, the certification or whatever else, or the de degrees or what else uh, away from them. Yeah. So, uh, so, so a lot of German wines are made by Dr. So-and-so. Oh, yeah, Dr. Lucen. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Dr. Lucen. <laughs> well, I was just referring to the fact that a lot of Germans have doctorates. Uh, oh, right. right. And, and a lot of makers. But, yes, Dr. Lucen, one of them, uh, is – we have you know quite a few from him, but – Really, really good Rieslings. If anyone's in, I know no one here gives a rat's ass. My bonus don't even know what the hell a Riesling is. But really, really good, good Rieslings, good meters and so forth. Yeah. Um, so so you also, and get, of course, we did, this lot, we did this in a live stream on the Whiskey Crusader show. I alluded to it earlier. So you've also gone the Whiskey Psalm route uh, uh, with the school down there in, in Austin. Yeah. Has that had any impact or, I think, enhanced at all working in the industry, you think? I find that more people are, more people have questions about whiskey than have questions about wine. Uh, if in my in my little introduction to people, I, I mention if you have questions about wine or whiskey, I'm the guy to come and talk to. I'm the guy to come and find. Uh, I'm here. This is what I do. Uh, come ask me questions. That's that's why I'm here. Um, 
and when I say whiskey or wine, one of the two people at the table usually uh, will kind of perk their head up and, or the other one across the table will say he likes, or she likes whiskey. Uh, and that's kind of, that's always fun. So uh, here's a question for you. So I, so my challenge with keeping the wine and the whiskey thing going is for me, what I've always done is I open a bottle of wine. I maybe put some in the glass, or maybe decant it. I fix dinner and so on and so forth. Um, I have some with dinner. And, and then the next day, what I'm doing now is I'll actually review it the next day because it's opened up over 24 hours. Or what I would do previously, I would do the video um, for the for the wine and then have dinner and then I'd finish the bottle uh, the, the next day. And so the pattern of the day is come up from work, do the wine, may have dinner and so forth. With yeah. whiskey, it's always, for me, it's always after dinner. So I have dinner without any alcoholic beverages. I don't, I just don't like following whiskey after wine. It makes the next day difficult and my palate, I just, I just don't like it. Yeah. So whiskey has become the after dinner drink. Um, unless I'm watching um, a YouTuber, you know, like live stream, Scotch for Dummies. Actually, that would be after dinner too. I try to have dinner before they go live and then I sit down and have something as I'm watching them. So what about for you? Where do you think, are you seeing working in a restaurant if people have them before, middle, after, or where, where are people having whiskeys? Uh, throughout their meal, and especially the whiskey cocktail. Uh, the old fashioned, uh, the the whiskey sour, the uh, Manhattan uh, are basically being consumed throughout meals. Okay, so whiskey people are having whiskey where other people would have a beer or wine? Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. I've tried that, and I end up, in order to have, you know, my ratio, so... I, so this particular had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have to have the right ratio of peanut butter sandwich to milk. I don't want to run out of milk before I finish the sandwich. And I don't want to finish the sandwich and I still have a huge glass of milk. I gotta have a, <laughs> or coffee. Coffee is easier. You can just refill your cup, you know, coffee and breakfast, whatever. Yeah. So, but I found was what happened was in order to keep the ratio of whiskey to food at the same time, man, I end up drinking a whole hell of a lot of whiskey. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm kind of, it's kind of, I'm, I'm tanked by the end of dinner. I'm like, no, this doesn't work. This doesn't work for me. I'm saying it doesn't work for me. And I can't say anybody else um, that, you know, I would rather just have it afterwards and just kind of chill and relax rather than try to get these two things. to. And so for me, whiskey pairing has been desserts and that's been about it. Yeah. Um most people are, are kind of just wanting to drink, I think. Yeah. So. They're not, you mean, you mean people in the restaurants aren't, aren't doing this and? Mm, not so much. <laughs> Trying to figure out what the bite. Yeah. Oh, I go right back for it. There you go. So what's the cuisine? So what's the cuisine? So there's a restaurant here called uh, Quality Bourbons and Barbecue. Ooh. And what actually, they do a, na a Nana wafer pudding, which is vanilla uh, pudding and it's got bourbon mixed into it. Uh, Nana wafers, uh, you know the vanilla wafers, mm -hmm. and the and it's perfect with a bourbon. Um, I just I just did a video of ice cream, a uh, Haagen Dazs That's bourbon, ice cream, which was and then uh, and and then I had that with bourbon. That was really nice. Yeah. But then I had an extra pint, and someone suggested in a comment make a milkshake. I'm like, out of it. Yeah, I'd do that as well. That'd be nice. Um, you can even put some more bourbon in there. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It would, it I, would, I would put a couple of jiggers of, of bourbon into the ice cream and make a milkshake out of it. So um, do you find what's the cuisine like of well, the restaurant where you're at? Uh, American cuisine. It's a steakhouse. Oh, OK, OK. OK, cool. That's my so we, we have some chicken recipes. We have some ribs. We have uh, the stroganoff. But mostly it's just uh, and some fish. We have some really, really nice right. fish, uh, but mostly we're steakhouse. Okay. But we have a butterscotch pudding jar that is um, butterscotch pudding, a layer of caramel, uh, some sea salt, and a little bit of whipped cream on top. And that with the whiskey, uh, specifically something like um, uh, a Glenmorangie, uh, would be, it is a really, really epic into the evening. By the way, if anybody's got any questions, put it in there. Did you type in anything so that your name could pop up so it can highlight? Uh, I yes, I did earlier. Okay. Anyway, again. Are you logged in as uh, Will Crusaders? Will all right. So, hey, if anybody's got any specific questions related to this, 
uh, go ahead and uh, put that in there. So the beer guys, they have uh, my brain just went blank. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Um, God, I hate this. You want me to say it? No, 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 no. Um, Cicerones. There it is. Cicerones, man. I knew it was back there. Now, people I know, including my, one of my cousins who plays the bagpipes, his his family, his side of the family is Scottish on his mother's side. Um, he, he's been a beer judge. He's a certified beer judge and so forth. And people have been into beer for a long period of time. When the Cicerone title started and certifications popped up, some of the guys have been doing beer for a long time. They're like, yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, but I do kind of like that they kind of have a term that works for it and says for it. So, but do you find um, the whiskey psalm thing along with, you know, being a floor psalm and so forth, it sort of fits, you know, just seems like the right shoe on the right foot? I think so. I, I think that it's, it, it definitely makes for an easy transition for me. Uh, people understand what it is. If I, if I told people I was a wine sommelier and a beer Cicerone, I might have to explain what a beer Cicerone is. Okay. Uh, saying I'm a wine sommelier and a whiskey sommelier, I don't have to really explain anything about that. Right. They, okay. They, okay. Most people have seen the documentary and or somebody has told them about it. Um, and they all want to talk to me about it. So are you planning on going on with uh, certifications in, in either wine or whiskey? I am still studying wine uh, because part of my job is to educate my staff and to right. keep them up to date on what's going on. And wine is never changing world, as you know. Um, and if you don't stay on top of things, you're going to get really far behind really quickly. Uh, right. So I am constantly studying. I'm, I'm battling back and forth between whether or not I want to spend uh, this year uh, basically studying and going hardcore again uh, because I'm on my third year. Uh, and with the Court of Master Sommeliers, you have a level one certification that's valid for three years. Um, in which time they want you to get your level two. Uh, if you don't get your level two within that three years, they kind of did your level one and you have to take that one again. So, uh, yeah, but I, I just put you do it in your sleep. It, well, it, that's true, but it's still a weekend that I don't want to spend. And you got to pay for it. Right. right. Which is bullshit. Although that's not nearly the, the cost of, uh, right. of the, uh, of some of the others. So, and that's the other, and that's the other challenge is so some some of the guys, one name names, who became Max Somaliers, you see them with their wives or girlfriends, they end up getting broken up and divorced and so forth, because it, it, it does become such an obsession. And it has, I mean, to, it has to become that obsession. If you don't yeah. have that obsession, you don't get it. You don't you don't advance to the next level. And the stress levels for me. I before coming up before an exam, whether it's a W set exam or uh, the court of mass, I would be so stressed, and I become you know, um, a, 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 you know, uh, irritable. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Hard, that's hard, hard to be around. around. And so this one coworker I had, I don't work with anymore. We st but we still keep in contact with. We're close friends. Um, she every time we go for another exam, she Eric, why do you do this to yourself? You know, and I said, it's kind of like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer because it feels so good when you stop. You know, <laughs> there is there is sort of an adrenaline rush that you pass and you're like, yes, or whatever. But also psychologically, the other direction, <laughs> uh, when you don't pass, it, it is a spiral. That you just yeah. go, oh, man, I don't, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go do something else. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to do this again. You know, I, the mental mind screw. Because... Yeah. The, Particularly the the masters, you know, it is the most difficult exam on any topic in any field uh, in the world, and ninety seven percent fail rate. Yeah, I mean it's freaking nuts. Yeah. So, so okay, and you're also married, and you have a young son who's is he five yet? He is. He's five. He's just and, started kindergarten. Right, right, right. So there's that in the mix, you know, in terms of and then work and just trying to juggle everything, but. It's better off, I would say, do when you're younger than when you're older. Uh, yeah. My issue is not absorbing information. Mine's recalling it just because I, I get the little circle that goes. Loading. 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 <laughs> just before I went live, before we went live, I was downloading software, and I'm like, oh, crap, we're running late here. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Oh, are we still loading? Um, somebody asked, uh, what is a good steak and whiskey pairing? Uh, Andrew. Andrew. 
Spirel. Uh, what's a good steak and whiskey pairing? Um, essentially, I'll give you my two cents and you give your two cents. We'll start with you. I think bourbon. I think bourbon's a, a fun way to go. Uh, or a nice smoky Isla Scotch if you want a nice uh, additive. Uh, but either compare or contrast. So uh, if you want to kind of go same flavors, I kind of beg and peat and smoke and, and dense and dark. Otherwise, I want to go bourbon, light and sweet and friendly uh, and, and pleasant. So I missed the question. Uh, it's hard to scroll back and find things. Was he specifically asking about a steak and whiskey or just a pairing period? Steak and whiskey. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so um, what's his name from um, that? Uh, what's that TV show? Something uh, Parks and Recreation. Yeah. Big on uh, he has a video where he's sitting down doing an interview and he's got a steak and he's drinking Lagavulin. I would say my response would be it depends on how the steak is prepared. Yeah. And that tends to be a lot of foods, even pairing with wine. It depends on how it's prepared. We so, have a, a, a lot of heavy pepper and a lot of heavy salt at the restaurant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then it's grilled on a ridiculously hot grill. So okay. You get a, you get a char, nice sear. Get a real yeah. nice sear. That char level. Is me, I'm drooling on my beard here. Excuse me. Uh, it's looking good, man. Uh, Thanks. I'm looking forward to my wizard stripes coming in one of these days. Uh, you're looking, you're looking good, man. My, my goal is to get it down to about here. Yeah. Get, get down here. Now I got a part-time job with Santa Claus at Christmas time. It'll make it. <laughs> so the, the moment, the, the chunk, so a peppercorn steak. I remember I went to a restaurant very early in my wine career, went to a restaurant, had a peppercorn steak and I had a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and the peppercorn on the steak overwhelmed the Cabernet. The Cabernet could not. So I, and this is actually kind of what got me thinking towards being more of a psalm because I was just studying wine making. I wasn't thinking in terms of food and wine pairing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I asked him, hey, this is kind of washing out um, the wine. What would you recommend? And he came back with a Syrah. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a Syrah. And, it, and that was like pff, perfect because Syrah has it ha Northern Rhone, uh, like Cornas. It could have, uh, or anyway, uh, could have a little less meaty character, but also that pepperness. Mm -hmm. The pepper would sort of complement. And when he came back, and he didn't charge me to change to give me another wine, which I thought was double cool. Yeah, um, I was like, that was it, and that was sort of a real great learning experience. Is that understanding pairing that it depends on how it's prepared. So same thing with the whiskeys. Some alcohols, when you pair them with a lot of spice exaggerates the spice and you get a bite not necessarily just from the alcohol but from the pepper in itself it's like the so, it's like you have a it's like the spice level goes up about three or four right. times for every 10 percent of alcohol you have in your in your drink that you're drinking and yet sometimes counterintuitively a, sp a spicy wine so for example i've had siraz with indian food and Indian mm -hmm. food is already spicy, and I would think, mm, no, nah, that'll be spice on spice. But no, it worked, and I don't know why. There's some other chemical reason for it. I think it's the same kind of concept as like a Moscato and a lemon cake when you're doing sweet on sweet. Right. Uh, as long as the food is spicier, or in this case, sweeter than the drink, uh, you're going to kind of find less of that sweetness in the food and more of that sweetness in the drink. Okay. So I think I would tend to go grilled meats. I would probably go more towards a peated scotch. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely wouldn't go. I, when I bourbons, I'm going to go more dessert. But I would probably go. I, I, I lag would be real nice. I'd be real nice. Probably wouldn't want to go to Freud. Uh, that would be a little, you know, jump on the shark on there. Little hell. Uh, nice. But yeah, you know, that's probably the route I would go with that one. Um, but I'd want some potatoes. Uh, something that's going to give me some starch background uh, to, to my consumption of voice. I got a bug phone right now. I'm freaking nuts. <laughs> so what's your point now? Uh, I pulled down a Weller 107. Mm -hmm. I've been totally nursing this thing. I haven't been drinking that that, that much. Um, although I also poured myself kind of a large pour. <laughs> so this, I don't know what this glass is called. It's sort of a cross between a rocks glass and a Glen Karen. Is that a Norlin? No, Norlin has an inner part and an outer part. So Norlin would have this weird side on the outside. Oh, that's right. I didn't know what this 
Uh, and I like this because if you want to, you can put an ice cube will fit in there. But yeah, I'm, it's I'm, like a large version of this uh, little Highland Park one that I have. Right, right, right. So, th and this was actually from Ben Riek. Uh, you see the print on there. So, a little st funny story about this one. So, I'm on my way back to the United States. I'm going through the Glasgow airport, going to head over to Heathrow in London, and then from there back to the United States. And, you know, I like to pop my head into the, um, uh, what do they call that? The, well, they sell whiskey, the um, tax free place, whatever the hell they call it. Man, I'm losing it. Uh, duty free. Duty free, yeah. Duty. I think a duty free is is like a kid's diaper that doesn't have poop in it. Uh, <laughs> I got a laugh from Sarah on that one. I can hear. I can hear. Dude, it's duty free. It's got no poop in it. Just pee pee. <laughs> anyway, I would have just going. Anyway, anyway, so I was going through there, and the guy, there was a guy there pouring samples um, of Glendronic and Ben Rick, and he recognized me in Glasgow. I'm like, he goes, yeah, I was just watching your videos. I'm watching your series on on the history of Scotch whiskey. And that's really, really weird, you know, to be on this side. And then somebody, because my channel's not not huge, you know, um, you know, I'm not Bill the Whiskey Dick or the Vault or something like that. So it was a trip. Anyway, so uh, I did a little video with him. Anyway, he gave me this glass to take home. I gave him one of my coins. Awesome. Anyway, so let's read this. Let's see, uh, this is from Travis Woolard, Eric Waite, Whiskey Crusader, Will, uh, Will. I'm more of a whiskey person and got a bottle of red wine. It's a blend of petite. I think it means petite pearl. What the hell is that? I don't know. I don't know that one. I was thinking the same thing. I don't uh, know a couple of those grapes. Well, it could be a typo as well. That's fair. Uh, Marco Folk? Frontenac. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Well, Frontenac. Frontenac is a region in the, on the, uh, uh, on the East, in the, uh, East Bank. Or right. right bank of Bordeaux. That's a whole nother piss me off. Uh, Marquette and Merlot. Interesting. Um, how should I pour and pair? A couple of things in there don't make any sense. So, okay, by the way, in terms of the wine world, there are like in, in Italy alone, somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 grape varietals, and they don't have them cataloged. I have a book this thick just on Italian grape varietals. So there are obscure grape varietals that can be out there that I've never heard of. Right. You know? And here's the other thing. And this is another thing. You, most grape varietals have like 20 different names for them. <laughs> you know, you, you change region and the grape is called completely something completely different, right? Uh, and yeah. so that's because grapes would move around and get planted somewhere else. And the local people, oh, we're going to call this. Uh, um, and, and so you need to know what are the most common names and what that grape is known elsewhere so it's very possible that these could be actual grape varietals but they're all same name as some other grape and i'm just not familiar with that particular name so anyway um but it sounds like a red wine uh with some tannin um how would i pour and pair um red meats uh, i'm sure i would have to smell and taste it to know more than, than what i do yeah, I mean, just I mean, with just Merlot being the the only thing that I'm actually recognizing in any of that, besides the region there. Uh, you say that was left bank or right bank? Uh, Frontenac. Yeah, yeah, right bank. Okay, so it might just be a really heavy Merlot or 100% Merlot out of and and you have more Merlot on the right. Well, yeah, percentage wise in terms of blends, you have more right Merlot on the right bank than yeah. the left. Anyway, so um, smell it, taste it, and uh, experiment. There you go. Um, here you go. Oh, okay. Stevie looked it up. Petite Pearl is a red wine hybrid. Oh, good for a really cold climate. Survived down to negative 32. Wow. Okay. They, somebody Googled it. Thank you very much. Um, again, there's a gazin. There's a gazin grapes that I never heard of. It's not definitely not a mainstay. Um, and w wouldn't come up in an exam, but thank you very much. Um, so the wine was a uh, an Iowa winery. Oh, so they might be growing all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, okay, that, that explains a whole okay. Northern okay. climates too. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so, okay, so I mean, that explains a whole other thing. First of all, there, uh, long story short or short story long, however you want to look at it. So, 
there are certain regions in that every four, all 48 states grow wine, but not all 48 states are naturally suited for growing great wines. So in order to deal with climate issues, soil issues, not having the best terroir is they're going to take American native varietals, which are not Vitis vinifera. They're these funky grapes that if you made a wine out of them itself, you'd be like, Ooh, that's weird. And so what they do is they've done hybrids or crossings uh, with uh, with a, a Vitis vinifera and then a native grape in order to try to get something that will actually grow where they're at. So my guess is particularly, what do you say? You say Iowa? Yeah. Yeah, that would be my guess. So there are a lot of, and you if you go to wineries, particularly where there's a lot of humidity, you go to uh, Georgia, Alabama, where you're not going to grow. It does. It's not. It's not like California. It's not like Oregon. It's not like Washington. It, you know. Uh, and so they're going to try to get something that'll grow that they can make. Um, they're going to do these weird ass hybrids, and you will never in a million years, never in a million years, see one even on a master sommelier exam, because they're always going to stick to vitis uh, vinifera. They're never going to do Native American grapes. It just, they just don't. Anyway, so that's that. But I'm interested. I'm kind of now. I'm thinking. I wonder if it's more of a sweeter wine, uh, because that tends tend to be what you end up with. But who knows? All righty. Uh, good question. And it sounds like you're typing away here. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I'm just kind of answering some questions and comments too. Oh yeah. So by the way, but next one of the answers the question. So what brings up another issue is to understand there are classic varietals and classic regions for grapes and whiskeys. Mm -hmm. So on an exam, let's say you have your five wines. If there's going to be a Pinot Noir, that Pinot Noir is going to come from California, but depending on what level you're at. Right. Uh, you California, know, Oregon, or Burgundy. Right. At the certified level. You right. Level, they could throw in Santa Rita Hills. They could throw in. Well, Spiepergunder from Germany, yeah. which is Pinot Noir. They yeah. could throw in. Uh, uh, um, Maybe uh, New Zealand. Yeah, Central Otago. I'm sorry, just killing the bugs here. Uh, yeah. Central Otago from New Zealand, Australia. If you watch the, th this is crazy. If you watch the third Psalm movie, there's a scene there where they're doing all these, these Pinots blind. One of the master sommeliers, no, if you haven't seen it, he names not, not only the varietal where it is, he names the region and the vineyard of where it came from and out of Australia. That's like uber nerdy, freaky, whatever, you know. I was like, holy cow. A psalm down the street from my restaurant has what I call identical palate or uh, pitch perfect palate. Um, one of those people that can sing a note just because you said it. I do. Uh, this guy can recall wine uh, in ways that I just don't understand. If yeah. he's tasted it before, it, it doesn't matter how long it's been since he's had it. He will be able to recall that that in exact taste again and tell you exactly what it is. It's insane. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know some other people are like that. I'm, I've always been sort of, I was in middle of the road on all, I've always had to try extra hard. Middle of the road in terms of tasting, middle of the road in terms of acquiring no and retaining knowledge. Um, I've never, I, I've only, I've been only been a work of a on the floor once for about six months. And the, the, per the person I worked for was a bitch. Um, now nah, I said, screw you lady. I'm making shit tons of money. I don't need your bullshit. I'm doing this just for the hell of it. I don't need your crap. Um, so screw you guys. I'm going to, you know, like, like Eric Cartman, you know, she, she was treating like shit. Um, and she was treating other people like shit and they were leaving. Anyway, I don't know going about yeah. that. So the drama of work, working as a song. So, um, so you're never going to get blind tasted on a Pinot Noir from Idaho. You know, um, it's going to be classic regions. Now, what's considered a classic region, as you go up the levels of certification, they're going to expand. They're going to expect you to, you know, recognize a Pinot Noir from South Africa. Mm -hmm. you know, whereas at the certified or maybe, and even in the advanced level, they would, but they're not going to put that down at the lower levels. So same thing with whiskeys. So, you know, a lot of guys doing blind tasting with whiskeys and so forth, but I think there are classic regions. They're still, yeah, there there are some peated whiskeys from Speyside. Yeah, there's some non-peated whiskeys from Isla. But I think there still are some classic profiles, generalities with uh, with Scotland um, and classic distinctive characteristics of a Kentucky bourbon versus a Texas bourbon versus, versus a Tennessee Scotland. whiskey. 
Yeah, California bourbon, exactly. Yeah. Well, there's always going to be exceptions. Yeah, you can always get tripped up. Someone can throw you in a ringer, but I think there's still classic profiles. And that's what you want to be tested on is um, the 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 uh, the main and the plain. Mm -hmm. One you can actually encounter in the retail or at a restaurant, not some bizarre, obscure grape that they're growing in Tahiti, you right. know, um, that no one's ever, because there's a Japanese grape and it slipped from mind at the moment that I've been wanting to try. That's a native Japanese grape, yeah. uh, but you can't get it here in the United States. Anyway, <laughs> two siblings says, Idaho potato barrel <laughs> aged wine. Mmm, yeah, let's get that one. <laughs> Uh, you're gonna get it one of these times. Yeah, I know these damn bugs are driving me freaking crazy. So, um, anyhow, so we've been at this for about an hour. Um, if anybody doesn't have any other questions, I kind of want to wrap this up. It's time for dinner, it's about seven o'clock here. Um, but it's been great having I want to have you on again, but on the wine channel, yeah, we'll wine. We'll open up some wine and we'll talk more, more varietals. Then you know, spend a lot more time talking about wine. So um, I would that that question about that wine earlier. I'm willing to put money on it. I could have thrown that same question at some master songs I know, and they would have been like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> and the, and when they find out it's some American hybrid, they're like, "Man, nobody drinks that shit." <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> they didn't tell me. <laughs> anyway, all righty. Hey, so I want to thank everyone for watching. I want to thank you for uh, coming on, but having having a great time. I really appreciate having you having uh, having the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Right. Sure, sure. And we'll do this again on the wine channel. Uh, all righty. Um, everyone give us a thumbs up. If you guys haven't subscribed, please do. And uh, if you guys haven't subscribed to the Whiskey Crusaders, uh, do that as well. And stay on. I'll chat with you a little bit afterwards. And until next time, hey, cheers.